You see, any woman who stepped out of role was considered suspect. A girl was to be a lady, a wife, a mother, caretaker of home and family, obedient, genteel, playing the piano, perfecting new embroidery stitches, cultivating a lovely garden. But the Blackwell sisters, we prefer to spend our time discussing women's education and the latest reforms. How proud we all were of you, Anna, an independent woman, off to Europe as a correspondent for Horace Greeley's newspaper, The Nation. Surely you must have considered marriage. I know I did. There was my beau George, remember him? He was clever, handsome, well-educated. Most people thought I was so fortunate. But something was missing in our relationship. He was too rigid, his views too narrow. I desired an ennobling companionship. I knew it wouldn't be possible. I saw no future in it, so I broke it off. Whenever I think about marriage, an image of Grandmother Blackwell sitting at the kitchen table, sipping her cup of tea, comes to mind. Now, girls, gather round, sit down, let's have a bit of tea. Anna, you sit next to me and pour. Marion, please pass out the cups. Emily, there is plenty of room next to Elizabeth. Sarah, I have saved this small chair just for you. Oh, how pleasant it is to have all five of you together. Now, young ladies, I want to give each of you some very important advice. Listen carefully. I expect each of you to be suspicious of male flattery. <laughs> yes, when a young man takes your hand and says, my dear, you are so beautiful. You are such a gracious young lady. I am so charmed. <laughs> Beware. Let me warn you. Once a man marries a woman, all that sweet talk ceases. And what becomes of the poor girl? Only just a bride? Too soon she realizes what a dreadful master marriage is. But by then, it is too late. I think that Grandmother Blackwell had a profound effect on all of us. I made up my mind, I will not marry. And it was the same for all the Blackwell sisters. For none of us married. Not a one of us. So now, I would need an engrossing pursuit for my life's work. I began to think of medicine more seriously now, though I didn't always find it such an attractive profession. In fact, sometimes I found it quite repugnant. Mary Donaldson helped me reach my decision, Anna. Do you remember her mother's friend? She lived near us in Cincinnati. I went to visit her when she was so ill. Ooh, how she suffered trying so hard to hide her pain, obviously near death, dying from some woman's disease. As I approached the bed, Mary grabbed my arm. <coughs> Do you know how difficult it is for me to talk openly and frankly with my doctor about my illness? <laughs> if only I had been treated by a woman. I'm certain that my worst sufferings could have been spared. Why don't you study medicine, Elizabeth? You are intelligent. You like to learn. Dr. Blackwell, how does that sound? Oh, child, you could make such a difference. But to become a physician, a profession for men, <laughs> there would be so many obstacles. Does she really intend to study medicine? Normal women don't wish to become doctors. Will she care for male patients too? It is not a profession for women. Women don't belong in medicine. Of course, I didn't agree with their beliefs. Certainly medicine was a laudable profession and surely women were capable enough. Perhaps some of the local doctors could give me some advice. I asked a few. Well, Miss Blackwell, uh, women are not suited for the profession. The schooling is too long and too arduous. The hours are tedious. No, I do not believe women belong in medicine. Another physician was a bit more courteous. 
Well, Elizabeth, even if this is a good idea, and I'm not saying that it is, getting into medical school will simply not be possible. Even my friend, Harriet Beecher Stowe, was reluctant. No, Elizabeth, I'd never advise you to go to medical school. But if you did go, I'm sure it could be valuable. So I determined if it was such a good idea and so valuable, then certainly it was a goal worth pursuing. Being a woman should make no difference. To become a physician became a moral battle for me, a battle worth fighting. I liked the idea, gave me energy. Yet I had little notion of how to go about getting into medical school. Dr. Dunglinson had written a book to help students prepare for medical school. The book began, the education of the youth intended for the medical profession should be essentially that, adapted, of course, for the well-educated gentleman. The well-educated gentleman. Now, I presume that will be my first obstacle. <laughs>